Yeah, here we are. Welcome. It is Geographically Challenged, episode number 53, and we're back. We've got the crew. We've got Pilsky, we've got Blair, and uh, we've got a little bit to talk about. It's not going to be a massive episode today because we want to just catch up on what has been happening over the last couple of weeks. And then after that, we are going to be jumping into maybe in the, the next couple of weeks, uh, an Asia RMR episode. So don't expect a huge amount out of this one. We'll talk about the Asia RMR in a couple of weeks. That's going to be the next episode. But for now... We've got to talk about what's happening in CS2 at this current moment and maybe what we missed over the last couple of weeks because you guys were not in the last episode because I did that one in Shanghai. So uh, let's talk about um, CS2 and where it's at at the moment because there's been a new update that did just drop. That was as of today. It dropped yesterday. There was a hotfix patch, sort of short, small patch this morning if you're in Australia. Uh, by the time this releases, which will be tomorrow, it will have been a couple of days ago. So everyone should know what that's all about. Uh, but yeah, it seems like a pretty big patch. Everyone was kind of like waiting for uh, a big patch. And there was a lot of people queuing, I guess, about how things are going at the moment. But it um, seems like this is a pretty good uh, little setup from, from Valve. I personally haven't seen too many people complaining about it outside of the smoke changes. But uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think, Blair, especially you've probably been the one that's played the most, I'd imagine, out of the three of us. How have you been feeling about things? Um... I don't like it feels like Pika's advantage seems much lesser right uh but then that's just me obviously I did speak to a few people like you know some some level 10s and some face of players who play quite quite often around here and even some of the players on Twitter have mentioned how Pika's advantage seem to be much lesser you can actually hold angles now to a at least a reasonable degree. So I think that's the biggest change for me. You know, the arms race, the arms, mm -hmm. sorry, not arms, the arms race thing coming back. I think that's good for the casuals. And you got to always remember, you know, sure, all of us look at the pros out of things, but there are a lot, massive casual base who do enjoy the game, who do, who are the, you know, the majority of the numbers for the game. So yeah, overall, I think it's pretty good. Uh, you know, the, the skin updates and everything, not something I really care about. Good stuff. The smokes mm -hmm. are massive though, They're right? Huge. So one of the things we saw in CS2 was the fact that if there's a light source behind a smoke, you could see a player's shadow even mm. with a smoke. I'll give you a good example. Let's say you're playing the A bomb site, you're a CT, uh, you're the solo A guy, you're holding towards A main cave, whatever, right? And, and, you, and you throw in a smoke. And even if, as a T, if you gather behind the smoke, there's a light source inside of A main, which can cast your shadow through the smoke. So if you're setting up for it, if the CT has good keen eyes, he's mm. going to spot you out, he's going to throw a molly, spam you, whatever. Now the smoke casts its own shadows thereby you know preventing this yeah unintended consequence i feel of source too so i think it's an overall good change that being said i did see a couple of tweets where it seems like one way smokes are back on the menu again boys so mm. apart from modesty i don't think anyone else is happy about that and it is worrying because katowice the the playoffs are going to mm. be played on the new patch yep. which was sounding great until this one-way thing came up so i hope Val fixes it in the next 24 yeah, hours maybe my my initial reaction was uh, when I saw that tweet that Cato was like, going to be on this patch, I was like, great. I mean, that seems like a good change, right? Like, cause awesome, everyone, yeah. everyone, everyone was saying, oh, it's, it's much better because advantage is, I mean, I guess it's it's not as big of a deal and the game feels better and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, it sounds like people are reacting positively to, to this uh, patch. But then Mac messaged me. He was like, yeah, I don't know if this is actually a good idea. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, well, the smokes are all fucked. And I was like, oh, how do you mean? Mm. Like, um, apparently they were like really flat as well. So I don't know if it's just that they've gotten bigger, but they've kind of gotten flatter, flatter. And then that, I think, was the hotfix this morning that they fixed mm -hmm. it yeah and so that may have changed things up again i don't know but um overall i guess the biggest takeaway for me is that it's good to see something actually happening that was still working on the game which is yeah. you know it's a good sign yeah yeah anything you want to throw yeah. in there pilski i just think it's crazy that they would like implement it for the playoffs um at the same time though they pr wouldn't have done that if they didn't speak to the players you know and, oh, they, did it, they did it with the players so, and then the players would have obviously voted for that so at the end of the day you know if there's any bullshit in the update they kind of signed they, they at least agreed you yeah. know to to deal with that so well, the we'll, thing we'll is see what they, happens they would the, want the big question more time on that patch prior to the rmrs because like if they don't mm. play these last couple True. of games on the patch then they're shooting themselves in the foot at least the teams that have made it to playoffs are shooting themselves in the foot leading into the rmrs i think so, the biggest question here is all the donk fantasy pickers mm. you know, has donk been nerfed or not i don't think he's gonna be nerfed i think it's still gonna be no. a fucking animal in the server but yeah. uh but i am genuinely i think it's really cool right we talk about the you know uh when it comes to such big gameplay changes especially when you know every the pros themselves are saying that biggest advantage seem much more manageable right i can hold angles right and immediately two days later we're going to see some of the best teams in the world play in mm. an arena on land to test this out so i am 
if even more excited about the the quarters on Friday for Cato, which I didn't think would be possible. So yeah, good job, Valve. I mean, a little late, but better later than never. You know? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be good. Um, actually, uh, while we're on the topic of Cato, I, I saw that there was like uh, an issue with uh, if you're in the qualifiers for Cato, you can't qual for Chengdu. I think the European closed qualifiers on the same day as the Katowice playoffs, which I thought was a little bit weird. But anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Not a big thing that we need to talk about, seeing as we're not here to really talk about EUCS. We're here to talk about Asia CS. Um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to sort of watching those uh, those Kato games. I think they're going to be good. Um, and, I, and I think either way, you know, regardless of how the patch actually ends up playing out, it's still good to kind of see actually something happening with the game. And I think it does, it does remind people, you know, the problem is like people have a very short memory. They're like, oh, Valve hasn't done anything. Like reminds people that actually they probably are working away in the background so it's kind of like a good little reminder it's like yeah, okay guys you can fucking relax again for for a second or two but um anyway let's move on to some of the asia topics and let's start uh, talking about what's been going down and i want to start things off with extreme sand because i want to start with some good news i don't know if you guys were sort of following along with extreme sand or, or any of the tweets that i was making while i was over there but i have to say this event was actually really fucking good which is i mean i it's kind of surprising to me because almost every time i go to to work an event in asia there's like some fuck thing something scuffed or there's more than one generally you know something's wrong servers take forever there's not you know not good conditions or this or that or always delays what are you talking about jordan what are you saying you didn't enjoy the carbex event in mumbai uh, look actually as far as things <laughs> went that one was actually not too bad that was actually pretty decent um but but like genuinely this extreme sign event i would say is probably the best it's definitely the best cs event i've worked in asia uh, it's probably mm. one of the best events I've actually worked in Asia. I've done a lot for like other titles as well, um, mm. which really surprised me, mm -hmm. really impressed me. And what, what I really want to reiterate about this as well that I think is important for us to sort of mention is that this was it, it involved Perfect World, right? So there was the way the event ran was obviously there's Extreme Sand, which I don't really 100% understand it, but it seems like Extreme Sand is like its own entity as part of like the Zowie organization because it's it's a Zowie Extreme Sand. That's how it is. Um, mm -hmm. And they're employees of Zowie, but Extreme Sand is the TO, quote unquote. But Extreme Sand is Zowie, but it's not Zowie, if that makes sense. So there's yeah. that. There's that group of people, which is Extreme Sand slash Zowie, and then there's Perfect World. And Perfect World was the uh, like the venue. So we had we were in the Perfect World Arena in Shanghai, uh, and a lot of the staff there that were working there obviously were employed by Perfect World, their, their production team, and this and that. And I think for, for the most part, a lot of the people behind the actual running of the show and the production were from Perfect World. And obviously, on the other side, the people organizing the actual event were on the Extreme Land slash Zowie side. Uh, and actually, from, from my perspective, both teams actually did a very good job. Um, but what really I felt was a, a hugely positive sign was the fact that Perfect World, obviously, they ran CAC. I don't know what your experience was like that with with that blair because i think a lot of it was probably through pgl you were working with pgl in the studio and stuff but from the people from perfect world that i worked with and that i spoke with uh actually on the ground and and from their uh you know from their arena to their to their studios to their sets all of that it ran fucking phenomenally they were very good they knew what they were doing they spoke great english they were very good at communicating as well to us as well which is often a problem when you go to asia is that very often you find like as an english speaker there's a few people that speak English, but like they're not really like the people that you need to actually talk to yep. to do the show. Whereas in this case, the people that needed to do the show actually spoke pretty good English, but we also had a dedicated translator, which is not something that I've had in a lot of past events as well. So very, very good stuff from both Extreme Sound and from Perfect World. But like I said, what, what impresses me the most is the fact that it was in the Perfect World studio, which is also, by the way, where the Asia RMR is going to be held for this for the Copenhagen major and I assume it's probably also going to be where it is for the Shanghai major as well let's see if, if, if we're putting two and two together so um really great really great time for that it's the way it seemed to me was that they were kind of like taking this as like almost a test run right they're like we're going to practice how we're going to do an event in this event in this venue with you know all these Asia teams and we're going to make it work and it worked it, it went phenomenally there was no delays on the broadcast there was no real tech issues the everything was great hospitality was good fucking can't complain at all um, the only thing was there was a fucking like 50 round long game between Tyler and the Mongols, which put us behind on one day. But apart from I mean, that, 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 I mean, that's a classic. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts or questions or anything you want to sort of touch on there. But um, yeah, really solid event is my takeaway. So congratulations, Extreme Zan. Well done. First time we've probably said that on a show on Geographical yeah. Challenge. Yeah. I mean, I would just say like, um, I'd like to see, 
you know, the, like this event for me, the opening games are not terribly interesting. I'd like to see some better teams invited, let's be real. Like mm -hmm. I'd like to see some Aussie teams. I'd like to see um, some better representation and better opportunities for some of the other teams, although I do understand the purpose of the event. Like, you know, I've literally been the team that was like the, I don't know, like Division Two team going into a professional league and then got absolutely slapped 13-3. And I know like representation for certain countries is great, but I don't think like on slashes learned that much from getting fisted every game. i got to be honest. And I don't think we're going to be seeing them again in Asian events. But, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, the playoffs was pretty cool. The thing that made me interested, which kind of like leads me into the topic, uh, the next topic as well, is that like there was uh, a lot of Asian CS happening at this time and a lot of the same teams playing each other in multiple different tournaments and you actually got different results. Mm. So I kind of wonder like whether there was um, there was different important, different uh, amounts of importance played uh, uh, placed on this event versus like potentially the qualifiers for other, you know, more important yeah, events yeah. for these teams. I think I, don't, I definitely don't think you're wrong. Like I think when it comes to Chengdu, uh, especially like the Chinese teams really want to qualify for Chengdu. So probably when you're looking at Tai Lu, for example, they so this is one other thing with that event was that it, it was on the same weekend as the Chengdu qualifiers. So Mongols yeah. and Tai Lu were both playing that Chengdu qualifier online while also playing Extremes Land. So they'd play their Extremes Land games during the day, and then that evening they would go and play um, the Chengdu qual. So I think they ended up playing like six or seven Bo3s in like two days or something like that, which was kind of crazy and multiple against each other as well. But as, as we yeah. know, obviously Tai Lu called for Chengdu and Mongols won Extremes Land. Um, so I think you're probably right. I think the Chinese teams probably put a little bit more emphasis on on that uh, Chengdu qualifier, but we'll, we'll talk about that in uh, a little bit. I, I oh, do agree with you as I well. I almost forgot as well. Mm. I just want to say it's great to see a Thai team back in the playoffs as well. I just yeah, wanted to say that. That, that Thai team um, <laughs> featuring four Mongolians and one Korean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, look, there's a few things like if, if I really wanted to nitpick and I wanted to say, okay, well, you could, if I wanted to say you could make improvements to this event, I think the actual event and the way it ran itself, that was fantastic. No, no complaints about that. But in terms of, as you say, like the interest in those early stage games, it was like, man, you're walking, I'm, I'm going into a game and I'm like, this is not even a concept. This is not even a game. Like there's, there's zero, like no one even really wants to watch this game. Like no one wants to watch on Slayers or, or Acme or whatever. Maybe you could have like a day one or an online stage where you it put needs... all these teams against yes. each other and qualify 100%. the best of those to the actual event. And then you're inviting, you know, your, your, your Mongols, Tyloo, Limvision, Greyhound, uh, Atox, whatever. I mean, look, NKT was actually pretty decent, but they were playing with two subs. So that was obviously less than ideal, um, but they were kind of at least fun to watch and sort of see how they were going. And the other thing actually there on that was, um, I spoke to Zion and he said that this is his last year competing in CS before he goes to um, military service. So um, salute. I mean, it's been a good run. Uh, hopefully, you know, they get something done in that NKT roster before he, uh, before he dips. But um, yeah, it was good to see like everyone again, you know, that was the big takeaway for me was like, it felt like, it felt like we went back five years to when CS was like a community. You know what I mean? Like you saw people, you're like, oh, hey man, like I haven't seen you in years. And it was like, I remember, you know, I remember what it was like to actually enjoy going to these events and not just, not that I don't just do it for work, but you know, like when you go to an IEM or something, it's like, this is a big fucking event. You know, there's lots on the line. It's like really important. Mm. You've got to be this and that and you've got to be professional and whatever, but extremes and it's like fun. It's like a community vibe and everyone's just there enjoying CS. And that was really cool to see. So um yeah i thought again like i said great event there are some things that they could definitely do to improve um and and i'm sure that based on what i've heard extremes and going to be back at some point this year so uh i'm i'm imagining some cool stuff in in, in the future i was actually unaware it, it was perfect world they were working with for this event initially mm. right yeah i thought it was going to be extreme slant on their own but yeah it makes a lot of sense right because they're going to be doing the second major this year uh this time around and Again, the, the good events, I've done quite a few events in Asia as well, primarily, you know, uh, Counter-Strike over the years. And the good ones have always been like, you know, the, the ESL events, right? The IEMs where they partner with local uh, org in China, or it's like a PGL slash Perfect World event, right? Mm -hmm. and like the CSC event, which happened like a, a few months ago was pretty good, but there were obviously some issues because we were doing it remotely the english broadcast was remote but overall like the stuff they did with the arena the crowd and everything even as much smaller arena i think was really top notch overall so the mm -hmm. fact that even some of the smaller events like you know uh, your experience over there was was just good overall and considering look considering how critical we are of 
Asian events. events. The yeah. fact that yeah, that this event was really good. I think it's a good sign. The teams and the results. I really didn't really look too much into it, right? Like there've been a lot, so much of CS being played recently. Obviously, you know, some of the the Mongols games and the Thai Lu's games. Those, those were interesting overall. But for me, the biggest takeaway is that you know, Extreme Slan coming back to for Asia. I think it's just a really good sign. Uh, and again, this was an invitational. It was a last minute invitational. If you remember Jordan as well, like you know, just a couple of months ago, they announced it, and they can get more teams. But if you can get eight of the best teams from you know Asia and Australia together, I think it'd be really you could basically run an Asia RMR like, but better Easy. actually almost because yeah. you wouldn't be constrained to inviting X amount of teams from X amount of regions. Like you could actually exactly. have yeah, you know, the two best Mongolian teams, the two best Chinese teams, probably the two best ANZ teams, and then and, you know maybe and whatever. The thing is, like, teams you if you remember, like the 2019 one is like we did have two Aussie teams there, which were like replacements for mm. the teams that were meant to come, and they were still yes. competitive. Yep. Like they were still like actually able to take series or like push some of the the teams. So that's what I like. That's what I feel like Extreme Plan should be. Yeah, the best, uh, some of the best teams in Asia or some of the best teams representing their region should be there. But I also what I loved about the 2019 one was that the teams that we watch in our regions, like that are sitting just in the sub top, even got a crack instead mm. of just teams that are like the best, not the really best. relevant. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, actually, what's yeah, what's interesting is, I guess, obviously, the, this was a eight-team event, whereas the previous was a sixteen-team event um, back in twenty nineteen. Mm. So you had a lot more sort of wiggle room in terms of invites and, and stuff like that. Um, and there's mm. a, the problem is like now there's a lot of regions that don't exist in twenty twenty four that did true. exist back in twenty nineteen. So like Korea as a CS region doesn't really exist. I did actually speak to those guys as well um, briefly. Uh, you know, they were nice guys. They were they were good guys, and they were like some of them. You know, I don't know if you remember Climax from back in the MVP PK days, like ages ago. He was there, like he was playing in the team, but most of them were like actual guys that had tried playing Valorant or Apex or whatever, uh, and they just sort of put together a pug team, and they they pretty much said exactly as much. They're like, well. Yeah, I mean, we would play more if there was like more stuff for us to kind of play in, but like we're probably going to go back to Valorant after this, is what they said. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was cool. Like the Middle Eastern team were pretty cool. Um, Acme, that was their name. Um, they were like not one of the top teams by any stretch of the imagination because the top teams had decided to stay back and play the Middle Eastern qualifiers for the Asia yeah. RMR. But they were good. They were like they were like no, they weren't amazing, you know. Like they kind of got pounded, but like they had never played a land before. It's first time going overseas, so you know, pretty cool for them. It's good uh, experience. I yeah. don't mind seeing that when it, like, when it's like an actual team with an actual region. The same for the Vietnamese team. Like they were an actual team that was trying to like be a team sort of thing. I don't mm. I don't really want to see like a situation where a team forms for this event only to take the slot. I think if if you if you're looking at you know Vietnam where there's a few teams, if you're looking at you know Middle East where there's a few teams, you're you know I mean like I think that's definitely something that you can work with. But I, I'm not such a fan of just putting a team together and just saying yeah we're going to take take this because there's a slot. Um, yeah. But then again, it's 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 that same argument of well, if there was more events like this, maybe there would actually be more teams from Korea, for example, that would take those slots. So yeah. And and also just less clashes like mm. i feel like it happens so much in asia like you can't get the best teams to come to events because there's just like clashes and overlaps but the thing i don't understand about that is is if if mongols and tai Lu can play the chengdu qualifier for at extremes and how can the middle eastern teams have not been able to play the middle east coast qualifier is it is it a ping thing are the servers from like china to the Middle East, whatever service they play on, impossible, impossible. impossible. Yeah, okay, yep. that's what it was. Impossible. Yeah, all right. Because it's because uh, it's like uh, about eighty to like eighty to hundred ping from me from India to play to you know in let's say Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not even talking about Shanghai service, which will be even further, and they're in Shanghai. And then on top of that, like for me to Middle East and Dubai, for example, is like. 40 which is not bad at all but you add it up i, I know routing doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. work that way but 150 ping minimum that's that's yeah, not, not not playable yeah. all right i understand yeah um look end of the day you know there's a few little gripes i guess but overall I have to say the takeaway was like it, it, it was it was such a relief you know like it's actually it's insane i couldn't describe it because i would i went in believe fucking imagine this okay you go into the rehearsal day all the graphics are playing, you know, uh, the the studio set up, the, Damn, you boy. sit down in the chair, the guy's <laughs> talking in your ear, you can understand him, he can understand you. Like the, the rehearsal goes, you do your little fucking, the, the hosts on the stage, they do their little intro, right? Then they throw to you, you do your little segment, practice segment, and then it's like, okay, we're in game, we do the, we do the, oh yeah, we've finished the game, post game segment, and then they're like, all right, you guys are done. 
two casters, okay? Two casters do that. The third guy, they go, do you want to have a go? He goes, no, nah, I think I'm good. Okay, guys, you can go home. That was it. It was like two hours. It was like, I was like, there's no way. Like, I've never had An a rehearsal day that good. fucking rehearsal. I've never Damn, had a rehearsal dude. day that good. And then I went home and I messaged Sarah, my partner, and I said to her, I'm like, there's no way it's going to go that smooth for the rest of the event. Like, that was an anomaly. And then the first day happened and it went smooth as fuck. And I was like, holy shit. Like, what the hell is going on here? Like, this actually might be a thing. But I'm not getting my hopes up because something always goes fucking wrong at these events. And then day two goes I... and it was fine. And then day three went and it was fine. And I was like... Holy oh, shit, I have found the unicorn. A... I found a unicorn in China. They actually exist. <laughs> not even a single noodle was slurped in your ear. Yeah, so. I wonder how many people got that reference. Really good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will, okay. I think we've, it's been fucking great, uh, but I will give recommendation, which might sound a little selfish coming mm. from, you know, me or Mitch, but I feel like considering the amount of effort to put in everything over there, uh, and I think everyone, you know, did a pretty reasonably, you know, bloody damn good job uh, on the talent side of things. But I think having more talent would have been ideal. I feel like mm -hmm. when you're doing all of this, right, having just three casters rotating out and the two guys just doing the pre and show and everything across the entire day counts, like it can be very tiring. It can be very draining altogether. So for me, it's more like, hey, you know, get two pairs of casters for the entire thing and just get a desk on board. Yeah, I, I think a fourth, so much money a fourth anyway. caster would have been good. Uh, definitely. I When I originally thought about it, I thought that um, the host was actually going to be a desk host and that they were going to have a local Chinese stage host. But what ended up happening was That's that it I was well. yeah. English and Chinese on stage uh, and then uh, no desk host. But actually, probably what would have been better, especially because the, the Chinese host, which I don't know if you guys know Baseline J, um, he's a Chinese content creator. Yeah. yeah. He's been around. Um, he can actually speak English. Like his English is perfectly fine. Uh, it's pretty like, damn good, like, yeah, actually. Yeah, very, very good. So he could have probably hosted in English and Chinese on his own on the stage. And we could have had uh, an English desk host. I think that might have actually been a better better setup. But I agree, two, two cast of duos also would be kind of nice. Plus, look, yeah. I don't want to be I'm, anyone, but I think having CS people there would also be nice. Like I was the only I, CS person, which the guys that I worked with did great. I, I definitely had no issue with working with any of them. But also I felt like if this is a celebration of Counter-Strike, you know, it would be nice to have some of the people involved in Asian CS actually there as well. Yeah, as well. and I think like the people that they hired are the are the top of their game, so that's fine. But at the same time, like if you're gonna be like a little bit frugal on talent or do three talent, there's literally people in the region who are endemic to the game who can yeah. host and cast, mm. like do both, including Jordan. So, <laughs> like you know, you definitely could have gone that route as well. I did. At the end of the day, though, the people who do the hiring for these kind of events i just I, I don't think that they're aware so that's fine well well, to their credit i mean to the credit of the guys that work there they all you know they took to cs like they didn't fuck around they weren't just there for a fucking paycheck necessarily like they were asking questions yeah. and they were interested in in learning and stuff and they were all kind of i think they all were a little bit surprised at what the event was like because they were all sort of saying like oh this actually feels like what esports used to feel like you know it's like when people go and they actually want to be at the event and i was like yeah like Dude. believe it or not that's actually what this is like people do want to to do this event like it's kind of kind of crazy it's not just for the for the money or it's just not just for the oh we're here to do our fucking game and rock up and leave like that's that's yeah i, I was i was actually having a chat with uh with chubby ninja right victoria mm -hmm. like the the host right yeah uh, I, I met her i met her at nick's wedding mm -hmm. uh you know lovely lovely lady very very yeah. talented yeah. what she does and everything but she's I mean, she's done other stuff as well. And for her, I think like her main game has always been Valorant, right? She's never mm -hmm. been into CS, so to speak. She's been just asking me questions about just generic stuff and whatnot. And the funniest thing was while the event was happening, she's like, man, these CS guys are like a whole different breed altogether. I'm like, hell yeah. It's like, they say shit we'd never say at Valorant. I'm like, yeah, it's not even that bad. You just see some of the other shit we say, right? Yeah. And it's just like, I feel like for other people, you know, who haven't, uh, who haven't done CS in a while or, or who have never done Counter-Strike coming in, you know, they it, CS has that very... Uh, shall we say non-polished, non-marketing product feel, as opposed to a lot of other esports out there. So I think it's for even for people coming in, mm. it's uh, it's interesting. So you know, at least from uh, from from Vicky's POV, like she seemed to have a really good time as well. I think uh, they all the event, did. So. I actually think they all yeah. did, and they all said, you know, they they enjoyed it, and you know, hopefully CS does well and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, maybe they're converts. I kept trying to say like, oh, you know, you should come over BCS yeah, talent, come and then I was side. like, but, 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 but maybe don't because there won't actually be that much work if you do, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, we, we were ribbing each other a little bit back and forth about CS vs. Val. Um, but yeah, anyway, look, uh, I guess we should move on. We've been talking about Extreme Zone for 20 minutes. But yeah, end of the day, look, great job. I thought uh, perfect launch event. Hopefully we'll see more in the future. A few little things to fix, but overall, you know, 
Nine out of ten, Good basically, job. would be my takeaway. Um, Massive now, win. let's talk about the Asia RMR quals and how that's all gone down because there was a lot going on there. First thing I want to touch on here is 3,000 teams in the China qualifier. I don't know what's going on there. Is that legit? I mean, I could see it being legit. It's probably a lot of shitter teams, but that just goes to show the interest is there. I that, that that's the thing with that, right? Like, um, I'm sure there were a lot of teams. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure there were a lot of teams. How many of them actually checked in? Probably yeah, half. Number one, half. number two. Over the years, that always reminds me of these fucking viewership numbers we used to get for some of the you know some yeah. of the uh, Chinese streaming sites, which a lot of which have gone defunct now, by the way, right? They'll be like, oh yeah, there were a million viewers. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't make any sense. So. While I really like to believe that, you know, uh, it was a very big number. I think that 3,000 was a little bit inflated. But if that is indeed the case, holy shit, let's fucking go. Let's fucking go, dog. Even if it's, even if it's inflated, even if it's doubled, man, like, that's still a lot. 1,500 is fucking insane, right? Yeah. For just one region, not even like, yeah. you know. Well, well, one country, not, it, yeah. Yeah, one country, that's it. What fucking was Europe? Insane. Europe uh, just barely got past 1,000, right? Well, they had that one qualifier that went over a thousand and twenty-four, I think, which was the no, one. That no, no, they they, they act, it went it actually went over a thousand twenty-four. Uh, I think on the second, third onwards, so they had to have like um, you know brackets, they, they yeah. had to keep yeah they yeah. had to split brackets yeah. and you had to yeah. keep some teams in in reserve and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a small conversation I'd like to like pick your brains on because I was talking about that right and the, obviously uh, Kassad Blue didn't get through the the you know the second qualifier or I think the third one if I'm not mistaken because yeah, of that it was, yeah. a problem. And they're like, oh, it's an open qualifier. Why can't we sign up? Now I can see it from uh, the players and the team's POV where they should be like, we should have an opportunity to play regardless of how many teams there are, right? But from a TO's perspective, the guys handling it, you know, making the brackets and everything, it, it is chaotic. It is insane. Do you keep a cap on the number of teams that can sign up for an open qualifier? And this is a more generic thing doesn't necessarily have to be for the major, but it's more important for the major because the major is that thing, right? Where everyone gets the chance to play. So do you cap that to just 1,024 or even 2,000? And, you know, and if you don't check it in on time or whatever, you don't get to play, or do you just make it completely open like like the Chinese guys did, for example? Yeah, I think it's hard to say because I it, like you'd need to... I uh, My question whenever we come into like these kind of situations is like, is there precedent for this situation? And like, if there is, and it's something that could have been like for like uh, foreshadowed a little bit as as like an issue, then it's something that they should have had a contingency for. But if it happened that way, and a few teams missed out, and the large majority got a uh, you know, uh, well, I won't say a good experience from what I've seen in terms of the whinging on Twitter, but and they got into the qualifier, they got to play, and then the very next qualifier they changed it. I think mm. that that's about as good as you can expect in a lot of these situations. Esports is, at the end of the day, you know, we're not perfect. And most of the time, in my experience, coming from this region, they will fuck things up and then not even fix it the next one. So, like, fixing True. it straight away into the, the very next qualifier is probably a good sign. It just And at the end of the day, you know, there's always competing interests. Um, you know, between the the teams and the TOs, um, and their their opposite sides of things. So I think all you can do is just try to err on the side of you know making sure the majority has a good experience. And sometimes mm. that means that that people, you know, end up getting overlooked, as we often see in our in our region as well. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a it's a hard one, really. I think at the end of the day, like my two cents is it is an open qual. So if it's an open qual, you'd probably want to see everyone be able to compete yeah. but i understand but, logistically but I the logistics it, man like it's just it's i and this is something that we'll get into as well i guess it's it's probably a good sort of tie-in with what happened in asia and, and it's a bit to an extent this happened in europe as well there was like the whole cheating thing and um you know it, there's just so much going on for these guys to deal with and in all the cases they're probably volunteers and you know what at what point do you say okay we're gonna need like 50 admins on at one time because like if we're running mm -hmm. 1024 team bracket that's 500 plus games going on at any given time you know, it's going to take time for people to, if there's a server issue or if there's this or that or whatever, yeah. like, oh, I, might, I can't get in the game, whatever. It's like someone actively yep. needs to be there to help. And, you know, you can't have, say, a hundred admins. Like, that's just unrealistic on at any yeah. given time. Plus, not good you, might not even, you might not even need them at that point, you know, and then you're wasting your time, wasting your money, whatever. So, yeah. I don't know. Gray Let's area, but I'd like to see people get the chance if it's an open qual to play but yeah cheating in the asia rmr that's going to be one of the one of the big topics of um 
the the last couple of weeks and and i think mm-hmm. it has kind of died down uh by now we're a little bit late to this conversation though i, I did talk about it with Kay when i was in shanghai on that last episode and mm-hmm. i, I kind of wanted to sort of follow up on it and see what your thoughts are as well because i'm kind of interested to to get your two cents on this whole situation hey. so um just for those who quickly don't know who haven't maybe been keeping up with it there was a couple of teams in the asia rmr who people leveled accusations at Meng Yu was one of them um, and one of the teams actually that made it through into the uh, into the Asia RMR uh, which was Troublemakers they they also had some accusations what a fucking name by the way yeah it's like (laughs) as well (laughs) so um, I don't know what do you guys you guys want to like comment on it or or anything like that before I like really go too in depth Uh, on it I think I'm just going to give my my overall uh, like just my take on that particular Mm -hmm. thing and this was against uh, I think the biggest complaint was from uh, the Indian team, right? Uh, I think God's Reign, uh, they lost to them in close fashion, whatnot. Mm. Look, this is so nuanced and you know, so many layers to it that it, there is no clear cut answer or solution. Firstly, I still stand with the fact that, like, you know, for uh, obviously you know, it came down to challenger mode you know, and uh, uh, Acros anti cheat, which is being used, right? Which already have a lot of problems. And, and Acros is interestingly a company that when I was working in so strong that we dabbled with, we actually worked with them for a, for, a, for a while, right? And they're, look, they've been trying their best, right? I'm never gonna like say, oh, they're not as good as face it or whatever. They aren't, but that's fine. They don't have the resources or whatever, but they weren't quite ready from what I understand for the scale of what was happening. And that is something which happened four or five years ago when we were using them as well, because uh, we I think we had a tournament and we were using Acres Anti Cheat and they just couldn't scale to the teams that were playing, right? So that was a big problem, right? They're number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, Regardless of whether troublemakers are cheating or not, using demos to witch hunt is something I'll always stand against. Unless the guy's literally spinboarding through walls, yeah. in which case yeah. that's like, like you know, even someone who doesn't play Counter Strike can can figure out it's cheating. Apart from that, you just can't use it. it. It just can't. And sure, you can try and cut certain clips and make it look very, uh, you know, reasonable and whatnot. But it's so much more context, right? It could also be just pure dumb luck or whatnot. So I saw the tweet from uh, God's Reign. I didn't add anything to it i got a lot of messages from a lot of indian you know followers of mine like yo dude you gotta like you know talk about it so i'm like i can't talk about this because yeah. yeah sure you know the admins have to look into it whatnot they, they have to do the due diligence but demo based bands is something i will never stand for but then we saw that leak chat where uh, i think one of the admins from challenger mode was mm-hmm. like oh yeah you know he probably heard his knife is switching to a yeah, knife, which yeah. is not the case as I worked in CSGO or CS2. And then obviously I made a tweet about that. And I was like, yeah, this is, this isn't, you know, yeah, this is, I'm not a fan of, you know, people watching through demos, but the fact that the people watching it themselves don't seem to know what they're talking about is a bad That's a problem for deal, sure. right? Yeah. Then it goes to the top of Reddit and I actually got a DM from the person in question uh, where he was like, yo, you know, really sorry about what happened, whatnot, but he's just getting inundated with like he got death, death threats, threats. he got shit. death threats and he got like... death threats and i immediately took down the tweet i made yeah. uh because look he fucked up at fault you know yeah, call but... him out that's fine but death threats man that's i said this up, on the right? last episode i said this on the last episode i'll reiterate it again that that guy regardless of whether he makes that comment or not isn't the one that's making the decision that that team's going to get banned at the end of the exactly. day and this is something that i wanted to follow up on as well um and, and I'll let you have your piece in a second, Pilski. But because because of the last episode, I actually spoke to another one of the admins. So, you know, there was a few guys obviously working at that. And, I, you know, we were having a bit of a chat and he was like, well, you know, can I give you my context of the situation? And because I said some, something like, oh, this should have gone like up the chain, you know, like why is it these regional admins that are just here to like make sure the servers are running fine? Mm-hmm. Being the ones that are having to reply to this, all, all this cheating accusation. And apparently uh, at some point, you know, obviously that did, that did get uh, raised higher up, and at the end of the day, like I think, I think part of this is a failure on the behalf of of PGL or Challenger Mode or whoever in an official capacity. Valve. Valve. Well, Valve. It's Valve's attitude. It's their tournament. No, no, it's no, their no, fucking well, tournament, right? Well, uh, apart from that, but what I, I what my point is, the communication is part of the issue as well. Okay, if if the communication comes through, and from what I understand as well, having spoken to some uh, other players and stuff like that, there was a statement that was given to the players. That was basically, I, I can read it word for word. Upon completing the investigation, it was concluded that the troublemakers are eligible to, partic- to participate in the Asia RMR. We understand and take into account all of your concerns. Rest assured, we have meticulously examined all aspects, including demos and communication records. We thank you for your patience and understanding. And I don't understand why 
that is not actually released publicly, right? It's public enough that it's been given to the players and they all know. But why is that communi- Why is that not communicated to the public? Because at that point, you don't get any closure on the situation. As far as we're aware, unless we know that that has come through, like unless you talk to a player and said, oh, have you, have you got any statement? That statement, as far as I know, didn't go out to the public. So people are still like, oh, is Troublemakers going to be playing in the Asia RMR? Are they still under investigation? Uh, or are they clean? Like, has this even been investigated? Which now, as far as I understand, the answer is yes. Whether or not there's more of an investigation going on or if anyone's QQ'd further, I don't know. But I think it's important that at least, especially for this team that's going to the Asia RMR, someone says something. And that's why I'm actually saying this, because, you know, even though we have a small influence, at least some people will hear this and say, oh, OK, they have been actually checked out and, and cleared. They are going to the Asia RMR, to my understanding at this point in time. You know, and they have been checked. And it wasn't just by the guys that are sitting in the Discord on the day of the open qualifiers, making sure people get in service. It's actually by the people who are supposed to be checking this out at a higher level. So, uh, look, I had a longer conversation with these guys and, and I sort of, you know, they gave me their um, timeline of events and what they did and stuff like that. And I have to say with the context that I got, I don't think that the admins necessarily did anything incorrectly with the situation. They were inundated by a lot of people there's only a few of them doing any of this at a time. The biggest problem was that communication. That communication by that one guy, and then that blows up, and obviously people are like, well, that's extra fuel to the fire that we can now fucking just go ham. Like, I agree with you that yep. demos, you can't use them as a way of, no way. Um, you know, even, even accusing people, I just think it's a bit of a meme. So, yeah, I, I understand why players are getting like really... Uh, invested in this because at the end of the day this is like the dream right you want to make it through and you know go to the Asia RMR go to the major and stuff like that but there's a process to be followed and you can't can't go this way like it just doesn't it's not going to work you know it looks stupid it looks stupid especially in hindsight when you know now in theory everything's been cleared it's like well that was a bit dumb you just lost because they were better so anyway what do you have to say Pilski uh I have a lot to say but I'll just give my cliff notes um First of all, I feel like anybody who's like coming out of the woodwork and like looking at this issue, you guys must be fucking new like last few years because this has literally been happening for like every version of CS for the longest time now. 20 fucking um, years. Yeah, this is literally, guys, I'll let you know, every qualifier has cheaters in it. Every single one. It, 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 there's no way you can avoid it. Valve does not have an intrusive anti-cheat. The anti-cheats that we supplement with them with outside of maybe face it, I would say, but even face it has cheaters are not good. Across, um, yeah, you could say it's scaling issues. I'll tell you guys for free that that has been used in small Australian tournaments and been shit, like literally small scale tournaments. And the players have had nothing but issues with their FPS drops, stutters, kicking, booting them out of games, causing tech issues, not actually being an effective anti-cheat. So if it can't work on a small scale, it's not going to work for a major qualifier. Like the, uh, it just does. I, I've heard nothing but bad things about that anti-cheat program. Honestly, the, the, I've never heard a good thing about it. Um, as far as the, and until Valve introduces like an intrusive anti-cheat like Valorant has, it's never going to change. I, I've been playing Valorant for like three years now. I've played like two cheaters. And I haven't competed, but like comp in competition, there's going to be way less cheaters than matchmaking. I played matchmaking so regularly. I've faced very fucking few cheaters with a kernel level anti cheat. You know, like the anti cheat in Counter Strike is dog shit. And it's been dog shit the entire time I played Counter Strike. So, and there's always been cheaters and there's always been all kinds of issues. This is not a new problem, guys. Uh, what I'll say about Devo Review um, in the past, there's been so many players falsely uh, exactly uh falsely, what I said on the last episode. like false positives mm, mm. like for example when i was competing at the start of csgo uh the little player you guys might have heard of him ins yep. was banned by the the best tournament in australia for cheating and uh he was not the only one there were other high named players i think grat was also were, Ali, yeah grat maybe might have been banned point. there was plenty of players yeah. who have all been false positive banned off the back of demo reviews mm -hmm. uh you are basically dan emming it you know like if you do not have legit like high level knowledge of what a cheat looks like then shut the fuck up and there's only like very few people who could actually like demo like Mihao and and guys like that who actually understand and are high level admins 
that actually know how to look for it. And even they say when they get like a demo review and they see, oh, I think this guy's cheating, even they say that is circumstantial evidence. That is not something you're going to commit someone, uh, convict someone for. So, you know, uh, I, I, that's all I have to say about that. In terms of scaling issues, though, which is something that Blair talked about, what I'll say is that, I, like, it's also all kinds of issues, not only with, like, software, not only with what we're talking about in terms of implementing brackets and scaling things up for the major qual, but also, like, hiring competent admins, you know, like, legit, the, there's only so many competent admins to go around. There's only so much bread in terms of being an admin to where there's enough tournaments for someone to actually get good at the job. And there's only certain TOs that you can work for to get good at the job. So you're not going to become a good admin and there's not going to be enough good admins to actually service a tournament of this size. So you're going to get people who don't know what they're talking about. That is just a fact. I've literally been to overseas events and been told by admins, oh, you're not allowed to talk in a tactical timeout. And I go, I'm the coach and I just called the tactical timeout. I'm allowed to talk now. And then he goes, oh, okay. And then literally another international event. I don't think it's the same TO, but same country at least. Um, very recently, uh, having the admin standing behind us and going, hey, admin, my player has this issue. How can we fix it? And he goes, I actually don't know how to fix that. I go, cool. And then I'm like, can you get someone who knows how to fix it? And he goes, yeah, let me try. And then he comes back and he's like, oh, uh, I don't know. I think he's busy right now or I can't find him. And I'm like, all right. And so my player just played with the played the match with the issue, like he he couldn't use like a bunch of keys on his keyboard because he couldn't fix it. So like you know, guys, it's not this. None of this is new. This is just like esports. This is just esports things. The the thing is, we just don't talk about it ninety nine percent of the time. And then sometimes we like to round up the witch hunt and get all the boys involved on Twitter so that we can have a nice little drama fest. That's and that's about it. We need to find our impressions like, that's, every time. <laughs> this is classic. Anyway, I think we're all kind of in agreement, and I think that that very much uh, is in line with uh, most of the discourse over the last couple of weeks. That it's just a bit like I'm just I'm just going to like uh, I, I did interrupt you earlier, like with that point. Right? If you want to point fingers at one, look, there there are a lot of there are a lot of failures in the chain. It's happened so many times as well. If you want to point a finger, just point it at Valve, right? Just the anti cheat. If Valve had a functioning anti cheat, like like you know, like Riot does for 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 Valve, they have for the example. resources and the money to develop it. Yeah, they, they just want to do their own thing, fair enough, but it's because of Valve. If this existed, then any TO could do, a, a, you know, a good TO could just have an event and you just have to rely on the Valve anti cheat mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have any of this Acros problems. They wouldn't have any of this admin having to watch demo problems or whatnot. And sure, there might be a few edge cases here and there, but that's always going to happen, right? Regardless of which game it is. So if you're going to point a finger at one, like the source of all of this, that's to be Valve. I mean, I mean for fuck's yeah. sake, it's a major circuit. It's yeah. Valve tournament. It's their event, right? Mm. Why are we relying on third party anti cheat, whether it's Face It or or A Cross or whatever? So, yeah, that's that's my two cents. What what, what I would love to see as well is, uh, you know, and I think this is a bit of a tangent beyond the scope of this discussion, but you know, why are we even using a third party tournament like platform at that point? Why is it not in the game? You know, why is there not a a, a thing where you can sign up with five guys in the game? It just automatically seeds you into a bracket based on let's say your premier get your premier rating. You know, if you're fucking a, a, a stack of guys that's like thirty k, you, maybe you get a buy in the first round and the five k shitters play all in that first round and then slowly but surely you know you you get through to the decent teams and I don't know. I mean, I feel like that may be something that that would be pretty cool, right? You'd get. I'm sure you'd get record signups and you'd get record interest in a major if, if you could just sign up in the client. Because probably be half nice. the people playing the game don't even give a shit about esports. But that's one way that, you know, I mean, would, would get Again, it. Valorant, like they, they, they haven't done it yet. It's not implemented. I think this year is when they're like, they have that in league. It, but they got Premier, you know, Riot's got Premier. They literally are putting the esports tab on the game. Mm. Like I can click on it and see who all the. I mean, to be fair, the major is advertised in, in the game class. Yeah, as well, they, they like, have that at least, which is good. They've been doing that for a while. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's. But there. but you know, like in league, they have clash, right? Where you can sign up as a as a team of five and you play against other teams of five, and it's just based on like you know your skill level of your of your your group. You know, obviously sometimes you're going to get people on Smurfs and whatever, but you have to like attach your phone number, which you, you obviously have to do in CS as well. So. Like, there's ways to make it, like, pretty legit. And, share, yeah, there's going to probably be cheaters in this. But, like, I think, it, look, 
I mean, it's again, it's a bigger conversation than what we really have time for. But that would be cool. I would, yeah. I think that would be pretty cool. Anyway, we are taking a lot of time on all these topics, so we should move on. Um, we got Tyloo qualifying for Chengdu. We we did um, touch on that briefly. They did that while they were playing Extreme Land. Man, they played a lot of games. They played that fucking however many overtimes it was, six overtimes or something against um, Mongols on Inferno, and then later on that day. They played two best of ones at Extremes on the first day, and then one of them was obviously Mega Mega OT, which might as well have been the best of three. I think they played two best of threes that night, and then the next day, because they lost one of those best of threes on the first day in the Chengdu Quals, they had to play two best of threes, I think, again on the second day, one of which was the qualifier game, which they beat Mongols 2-0 in. Either way, the big, the big thing, boys, holy shit, Advent. <laughs> Advent was the no, top fragger. Shut the fuck up. He, shut the fuck and, uh, up. and this is unironically, he was the top fragger. He was the top fragger of any player in the server for that game. Of all 10 players, including the Mongols, Giga Crack, Turbo Kids, Techno, Blitz, Senzu, you know, who are those guys? Advent is back for one game. For one, one, let's be real, it was actually really only one map. He had one insane map, which was Nuke. He went 26 and 12 on, dropped 2.03 rating. Uh, and he had. He went eight and one and six and one in duels against Techno and Senzu. So it was Boomer mm. dominating Zuma, basically. And that was enough, apparently, for Tyloo to win 2 0 and qualify for Chengdu. So my takeaway from that is if Advent actually plays like an actual CS player, Tyloo can be good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's good to see them qualify for the Chinese event. I feel like we're getting a bit of scissors, paper, rock in the Chinese scene at the moment, though. Like Lin Vision always beats Tyloo, but Tyloo can beat Mongols and then. Mongols can beat beats Lin Vision, Vision. so mm. yeah, yeah, it's a it's an interesting little interaction. That's good though. That's actually good. I feel like it just keeps all these three teams on their toes. They've been playing a lot of Counter Strike, right? Online, Extreme Slam, whatnot, in the Perfect World League, uh, and I think it. I think it translates into something which you're going to be talking about later on, right? Jordan was about Mongols performing in Cato, where they were pretty fucking competitive, considering they haven't played in a while on international land as well. In fact, if you didn't choke that first fucking map, they would have made it through to the main stage. So I mean, overall... They, they got donked, but everyone got donked. So that's okay. Got, no, uh, I think against Ents, it could have been a 2-0. The first map, they, they choked were, they, them massively, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. Uh, that could have been a 2-0. That would have been a qualifying game right there, right? So, and, and Ents, by the way, again, they're looking freaking solid right now with Glaive calling mm. for the Polish boy. So it would have been a really good scalp for them to take. I mean, do you want to talk about that now then? We can move that up, I guess. Um, yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's not anyone, much. It's anyone got like anything else to talk about for Tyloo to Chengdu? I mean, there's not much to say, really. Like, the fact that they can beat Mongols online 2-0 is, like, kind of good. I thought, actually, that, that Tyloo was kind of done. I really was like, okay, Mongols have definitely gone past them. Lin Vision is pretty pretty easily, like, argued to have been past Tyloo. But, like, with that result, I'm still, like... Ooh, like I don't, I don't expect them to call through the RMI, and we'll talk about that next episode. But like, uh, yeah. there's, a, there's still like that little bit of like bait hope, you know, in me. That's like, well, they're still the top four team, and if they have a good tournament, like they could still call. You know what I mean? So that's, that's they're what not I'll a top two it. team in Asia. No, they're not. No, no, and but they're a top four team all. in Asia. Yeah, anyway, fair. But, we'll talk about we'll talk about that is, next. Episode. But this is fucking yeah. Tyloo, so yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll yeah, talk about next it next episode. episode. Advent top one team world if Advent plays well. If Advent drops 2.0 every game, then yeah. And we're um, in the fucking major then, dude. Yeah, yeah, let's go. <laughs> uh, Rooster and the Mongols at Katowice, since we're sort of on that topic. Um, I oh, guess we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk Mongols first and then we'll touch on Rooster. Um, but yeah, look, I thought I thought Mongols did about as well as could be expected, actually, right? Like, they got that win over Furia. It was a little bit scrappy, you know, but it seems like a team that they actually have their number. Um, I don't know that I read into it too much. If it's like the same team that they keep beating, it's like they just they have a pretty good matchup here. Um, but you know, you want to see them do well against other teams and, um, you know, two zero lost the spirit. Okay. Whatever you get donked, but <laughs> everyone's getting donked. A very, yeah. very close game. One of them. Everyone's getting Ancient donked. was fucking close. Yeah. Ancient yeah. was super close. And then, uh, and then and one, two against Ensign. Like you said, I, I thought that was actually a quite a competitive series that they could have potentially I, won. So I can't really complain about Mongols at this event. I, I, I do want to go maybe a little bit more in detail about this. Like, I, I feel like the map vetoes could have been a little bit. Um, against the, that, that spirit game in particular, right? Like, mm -hmm. I know Mongols keep going for this Mirage pick, but I'm like, look, I, I get it's a map that you like to play that they're pretty uh, confident on, but it's not a map. You need to have a deeper map pool or a wider map pool because you can't keep picking up Mirage where they were a better team against Fira, but Fira, they like playing the Mirage as well, right? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you try and take it somewhere else, somewhere where you, oh, you're you maybe a little bit more better on? It didn't have to be that close. Number two, picking Mirage against fucking Donk 
if you've done your homework, you've done the how Spirit played that map, you don't want to do that, right? So 16-13-2 on your map pick against Spirit, that was just a complete storm. Ancient was freaking close, right? You could have been reasonably close as well. So I feel like the map pool, or rather, or rather the, the decision when it comes to the vetoes could be something they can put a little bit of thought on. And the thirdly, man, they need to start closing out games better. Right, the Mirage lost to N sixteen thirteen. They had a, it was a nine three half, dude. T side nine rounds, and they just completely shot the bed. They played too scared, and they struggled closing out games. Now I don't know if that's a coaching thing. I don't know if it's an IGLing thing. I don't know if it's the individuals just kind of choking be, up, so to speak. I think surely it's got to be that, right? Like they're quite a young team still. The oldest guy is like Blitz is think, like twenty, but it's been forever now, dude. Twenty four or something. It's, it's been a while now. Mizino, I think the other thing that is that Mizino seems like whenever he goes overseas, he, he he's struggling a little bit. He's not, yeah, I've seen enough, honestly. Like, his stats are not even that good in domestic events um, for the most part. But let's be real, like, um, we're seeing a lot of red, minus 40 in the play-in, like, mm. in a lot of close games. Um, but the kid's in like situation. 16 or 15 or something. So I like, know, I, I know. I can understand. Like, there's so but many like, good you know. Mongolian players, bro. Mm. Like, you mm. can't mm. keep playing like this. There is there is yep. so many people and who Mongols are chopping at the bit to get in they're Mongols. Gonna, they're going to cut someone. If they if they think they can get someone better, they're going to cut someone. Like, there's no doubt and about it, that. And, and, and Mara has percentage. shown that he is fucking ruthless when it comes mm. to that. Honestly, I'm okay with I've seen enough, bro. Like, I would cut him right now. What Atlanta, minus 26. Not before Atlanta, minus 20 okay maybe Not after the, the armor but i'm saying mark. like yeah. cologne minus 27 the in major the main will be stage. his last chance for sure yeah atlanta minus 26 and then minus 40 in the play-in like yep. you cannot play three events like that back to back the thing is events. i'll tell you what's going to happen right uh i hope i'm wrong i hope they prove me wrong they're going to qualify for the major i think so too right i, I think that's definitely going to happen right they're mm. going to go on through to the major and obviously at the major they're going to hopefully manage to pull through to the main stage i feel it's unlikely i think they're going to take a couple of maps off i think they're going to get a couple of wins it's going It'll to be, be the close, same two three or you know two yeah. three or whatever right and that's when they're going to have to cut mizzenio mm. uh i think he's been given enough time and yes i totally agree jordan is very young but there are other teams in, Mong in, in mongolia that he can play for get better mm. and maybe down the line it gets picked up by the mongols once again right but right mm. now the talent pool is so fucking deep in mongolia that they're doing themselves a disservice if they don't pick up someone new they, they have such uh, an insane yeah. core like like blitz techno they're fucking lock in every day of the week in my opinion Your techno is so fucking good right Te now he's, techno, he's getting better every fucking know, event it's I insane know. he's insane and then senzu as well has looked fantastic like Sen since senzu's been great since joining that team he's looked like a fucking he's like techno v2 you know what i mean like he's another little crack gamer kid that's just fucking entry frag and doesn't give a fuck and smart and, yeah there's so many of them in and mongolia right like, and it's like Okay, but I don't think Nine Ten's even the best opera in Mongolia, dude. <laughs> like, you know, he's okay. He's not terrible, right? But he does yeah, yeah. with a few shots, and maybe with the new, you know, with a new uh, update in CS, he's gonna come back to it, maybe, right? Maybe but that's the thing. Mazzino oh, being the true. weak link, mm. Mazzino being the weak link, it, it really hurts because I'm like, he's not like an indispensable player, right? He's not like an IGL or something, right? Right? You can just slot someone in. It's just the timing is very unfortunate right now. They have to wait for the major cycle to end but i think his days are. i, I think the team is still good enough though to to, to make it's it still very good it's still very good yeah anyway overall like katavita i thought pretty good generally speaking could be better but you know it's about where you'd expect mongols to be at right like it's it's that level where it's like they didn't overperform they didn't underperform they just did yeah. like a decent enough and, job. And, and and look at the teams they you know they lost too right both the teams oh, yeah. are in the playoffs right now as yeah. well again very close maps being pulled off but at one point i want to be like you know it's not just close maps it's actual wins coming wins. in yeah hope hopefully it happens very that'll, soon that'll come at the major don't worry about it katavita was Healthy just uh, just practice extremes land just practice yeah yeah totally it's time for the major um talk about rooster uh not quite as impressive unfortunately for rooster <laughs> i don't want to talk about rooster i did not want to talk about rooster man like well, nothing has changed to. you don't have to uh, dude like you lost to fucking coach like like it made even they were yelling out as well they're like he's a valorant player mm. right like you can't you you just can't like uh, what's going on like you know do, do you not have enough like you know sentience to realize that guys this isn't working out i know you're in a shit region i get it we everyone gets we keep saying that as well right but looking at a counter-strike i just don't see any improvement in fact i just feel like it's a fall off i don't know what's going on with this i team. think there is talent off, yeah for sure but, yeah. but, but what i will say yeah. to, to to their defense if i want to play devil's advocate here 
is that I, from my understanding, Chell uh, was on holidays. And again, you can say whether or not that's okay, but he was on holidays until just before Katowice. Um, and so they didn't, they didn't practice really. They didn't scream. They didn't have a boot camp, nothing like that. And there was not a whole lot going, a lot of game time going on um, is, is my understanding. I think which, a, again, tournament like, date, well, a tournament date changed as well, which meant they couldn't come to Kato as early as they wanted to and had to stay in O. So that fucked them as well. But yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. It's not a good enough excuse. I've heard enough about Chelios's holidays for like the last fucking three or four years. Like the cunt seems to go on holidays like 90% of the time. Um, there's players in that team like, that are just way too good and deserve like a better shot. And there's no room on Greyhound now that Dexter's in there. There's players on B and K as well. I would say that. Um, but like at the end of the day, they it doesn't feel like they want it enough. It doesn't feel like they want it enough for me. And um, they're doing themselves a disservice because they have so much talent in that team, and they have had multiple like more overseas opportunities than most oceanic teams get access to and at the end of the day their lack of trying is not only reflected in their katowice results but look at what happened in the chengdu qual like they're losing to fucking mind freak and shit who were playing very well to be fair but they're losing to mind freak was a dead teams. team basically by they the way that, that never, team doesn't exist yeah. anymore yeah they should never be fucking losing to that team and then after that like you saw them play against Bad News Kangaroos, a team that they had that last year, they had their number, they had their head to head to over them every fucking time. Playing with a stand in for the Pro League spot, they've won two times in a row and they got fucking fisted. They got absolutely fisted. Yeah. Wake up call, I think, for, uh, for Rooster, hopefully. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, obviously, you know, I don't know what what else is there really for them to play play in at the moment, uh, especially if they're just stuck in ANZ. I mean, I mean, hopefully we're getting uh, ESL Challenger Melbourne. Uh, the dates seem to line up, though I don't think anything's necessarily been announced for that. So there'll probably be a qualifier for that if that exists, and that will be the next thing I think that they would have to turn their attention toward beyond some of these like domestic things like ESL Challenger League and, and whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, pretty rough. Wasn't such a fan of it, unfortunately. I thought at least. A competitive game against M80 would have been nice, but I, I actually kind of hope that they would win that. And they should, didn't they should have won that. They like they owned. should be they, winning they that every day owned. of the week. You don't get a, you don't get a fucking opportunity like that overseas where you no, get no, like you, thrown you literally like a low they're ball. Not, they're not like literally an underhand like ball. Like you guys just fucking tap it in like that. Mm -hmm. You're playing a coach and an NA team. Like and given the fact that there, yeah. Because I mean, my point know. is, they, they only got to go to Katowice because Greyhound dropped the bag by not playing CCT. And I know there was yeah. other circumstances around that, but they only got this Katowice invite because Greyhound had, for some reason, dropped off of number one in the world ranking for... Because uh, they weren't playing domestic tournaments. Because they weren't playing domestic tournaments. Now that Greyhound is back with Dexa and they're playing at everything and they're trying to qual for everything... No shot, bro. You don't get that chance anymore. No one's this, this getting, was, no your, one's this was your chance. You missed your chance. You missed your opportunity. And, and, that was, and that's... that's I think that's the most egregious thing, right? Keeping everything aside. What's the one complaint about Aussie players? Even the interview their their coach gave, right? It's like, yeah, the bro, region, a... shit. We don't, we don't, we don't get. Yeah, but we, we don't, a, we don't get much practice. He's not actually. He's literally, literally a neemer, trial, but, but like everyone's just like saying how we don't have good practice, so they're totally fine, right? Now you've been gifted this opportunity, hmm. like just grind it in, right? Like no one gets to do that. Instead, you completely shit the bed. The CS wasn't even close. It wasn't even good counter strike. Like, what's happening, right? Yeah. And, and that's the most egregious most pissing off part that you got this golden opportunity make it work man like totally there's so many agree. teams in the region who don't do it bro there's that, so that much, pisses me off there's so much talent it pisses me off too because there's so much talent but it's just classic fucking complacency like the the pass mark for an australian team i mean i'm hoping greyhound is going to start to change this with their roster it looks really promising but the pass mark for australian teams which by the way we've never had this many opportunities to to show ourselves internationally the pass mark for an australian team is attending the tournament and then like just fucking around like or just not not doing well at all like you guys really think that if we keep shitting the bed and going last place every fucking tournament that we're going to have multiple teams overseas anymore it's not going to happen boys hmm. all right well we'll leave it there and uh move on to the last topic which is sky sports grand slam 2024 um just wanted to touch on this one quickly because again this sort of ties in actually to what you're saying there there's an oz qualifier there's an oz qualifier for this event um and obviously there's you know it's going to be in india in march uh, 50k prize pool so this is like you know it's not on the same level i would say as an extremes land in terms of like uh, an asia event necessarily because i think it's only the four teams but there's a couple of international teams an indian team 
and an Oz team. Uh, and so I think that's pretty cool. Good opportunity. Um, it's Aurora Gaming plus one invite team plus the Indian qualifier plus the, the ANZ qualifier. Um, and you know what? I'll give credit to Sky Esports. Uh, they've been reaching out to a lot of people in the AU community. I can tell because there's a lot of people in the AU community that are tweeting very... Uh, what shall I say? Like, like, uh, very, very good tweets about this. They've been they, the tweets have all the info. It's got the sign up link. It's got you know the dates. It's got. I'm like, wow. Where did you guys learn how to tweet? I think I think they've reached Don't out even to tweet a few about people. That, about fucking Aussie tournaments, mate. Exactly. Anyway, so they reached out to me and they said, oh, you know, can you talk about this? And I was like, yeah, well, I'll talk about it. Um, but but I'm sure they've reached out to a few other people and and they've all made tweets and stuff like that, which is good. I, I actually appreciate good that from from Sky Esports. I think the best way that you're going to get you know. Uh, people interested is to have the community, uh, you know, invested, and, and this is a good way of doing that. So I'll give them credit for that. I also think the ANZ qualifier is nice for for people from the ANZ region. No, no complaints about that one. So I don't know if you've heard anything about this event much yet, Blair. But you know, it's not too far away. It's in about a month or so. So uh, yeah, it should be good. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the timing gets a little off, but then again, there's so much you can do with the yeah. you know with the way the calendar is right with the major. I think it's happening around the same time as the major, right before. It must not be. It mistaken. wouldn't be clashing. There's no way it would be clashing. It shouldn't be clashing. Let me quickly take a look here. Uh, Sky Esports. It's in March, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the Sky Esports Championship. Uh, so sorry, Grand Sky Esports Grand Slam. Grand Slam. Sky okay, Sports it's not being. It's it's on HL TV yet. Uh, it's on Liquid Media. It's. 14 to 16 of March. Yeah, it, it is conflicting with the uh, with the major. It, oh, okay. No, That's no. It, it literally ends a day, the day before the major starts. So, oh, yeah. But if you're at the close. major, you're probably not going to be at that. Event. Yeah, but but anyway, apart from that, I think for the teams, you know, obviously, I'm assuming most of the teams who are going to be coming to this event are not going to be the major, right? So it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. And it's one of the smaller ones, by the way, right? It's one yeah. of the smaller events. I think they have yeah. the million-dollar prize pool or something or half a million just spreading across like year. five or six events over yeah. the year. So I'm going to be keeping 100% going to be keeping an eye on the event and how it how it runs, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I believe it's going to be in Pune, which is... Uh, a smaller little town in like smaller city, so to speak in, in, in India. I'm curious about how the logistics is going to be over there, what they're going to do. But yeah, I mean, you know, I hope it's an improvement over the, the last event, which uh, they did for CS, which I was a part of as well. And, and that'll give us a good gauge, a good idea as to how their next and the rest of the year's events are going to be. So yeah, I mm -hmm. definitely going to be on it and good luck. Yep. So it does. Uh, all right. Unless you got anything to say there, Pilski, we can move on to the questions and then say goodbye. All right, uh, we've got three from Miraz Rai, who's always a good question asker. We appreciate the questions. Uh, Miraz Rai is good. Shout out Miraz Rai. If, if Miraz, like, I can never pronounce the name, dude. Miraz, Miraz Rai. Rai. Miraz Rai, yeah. Um, Miraz Rai. If you'd like to ask us a question, do feel free in the comments. We'll be keen to answer it uh, on the next episode. And he says, another gripe I have with the Asian RMR is that Japan, South Korea, and Far Eastern Russian teams are forced to play with the Mongolians in the single open qualifier for the East Asia region. Yeah, the teams in the Middle Eastern region have three separate open qualifiers. While I understand that the three separate open quals are due to routing and ping issues, from a competitive standpoint, this becomes unfair to Japan, South Korea, and Far East and Russian teams. Having to face the much stronger Mongolian teams in open quals, while teams in Middle Eastern region only face teams in the wider region in their wider region in the closed qualifiers. Do you think this issue will be fixed in the next major? I would say probably not. I don't think it I don't probably think it not. gets changed because at the end of the day, like it's not a it's it is a meritocracy right this is a meritocracy they've got to play somewhere you can't have fucking a million qualifiers for all these regions at the end of the day they just got to play somewhere so, so. It's, it's it's not fair i get it uh but let's 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 try to like break this out a little bit right because i actually had a had a role in this because i was speaking to pgl they they reached out to me mm -hmm. uh for the online stuff and i did give my my input it's not like i designed entire thing i just gave my input on this the, the reason for the the, the Middle East is because the Middle East qualifiers, um, uh, Muraz Rai, it's for South Africa as well, which it just fucks him over anyway. But they have South Africa, right? They have like South Africa and, and a southern part of Africa, which is fucking far from the Middle East. So they have to have their own open qualifiers, right? It's unplayable for them. Then you have in the Middle East itself, the routing is so terrible, as you pointed out as well, that the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Council countries like Dubai, like not like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, those countries in the peninsula, they can only play amongst each other. And the rest of the Middle East, that's like, you know, towards Lebanon and all those parts, they have to play on an EU server or local server. So you need to have three open, and then they have the close qualifiers over there. Now, if you apply the same solution to the uh, to, 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 to East Asia, it's going to be the same thing, right? Let's say you have a, a Japanese and South Korean qualifier, open qualifier. You have a Far East Russian qualifier and have a Mongolian qualifier. And then obviously, the Mongolian is going to get more spots in the close qualifier because they're mm. obviously a stronger region. They're still going to get fisted, right? 
it's it's not fair, I know, but it, there is a solution to this. They're going to get fisted eventually. Was it, was it even different before Valorant? Like, I remember MVP PK always played the Mongolian teams or China. It, they were it, always it, it, looped it, into the same calls. Mongolia became their own region more recently because, you know, CS kind of died out in, in the region. Yeah. But if memory serves me right, and my memory is still serving me right here, it was always East Asia. It was, it was Hong Kong. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was Japan, yeah, these countries. Japan, Japan Hong Kong, South Mongolia, Korea, Mongolia. Mongolia. Mm-hmm. And depending on the TO, sometimes is uh, like Eastern Russia, Siberia, whatever, mm. or not. But it was always yeah. There was case. always there was always a specific China call. There was always an East Asia call, and then there was like yes. the ANZ call, and then there was the Middle East call. That's what Southeast it used to Asia, be. Southeast or, Asia or rest or of Asia. Asia. Southeast Asia, yeah. yeah. But now, yeah. now it, I don't think it's Southeast Asia anymore. I think it's rest of Asia now. But yes, it depends on like who you. I think Liquipedia calls it Southeast Asia, and the TO actually called it rest of Asia. But by the by, um, yeah, I don't think that changes. Also, it's something which is it's it's a it's a living, breathing animal, right? It's something which has always evolved over the years, depending on which yep. region is the strongest. Because I remember SCA had like in the beginning, 2014, they 15, spots, 16, yeah. they had way more spots because there were mm-hmm. way more teams from Southeast Asia, good teams actually, right? From from yep. Malaysia, we had the Boot Dreams Cap Boys, etc. Et yeah. Or the Thai teams, for example, right? So yeah. yeah. Uh, it's. I know it's not fair, but it is what it is, and I don't think there's a real solution to this, at least for now. Yeah. Next question is: What was the logic behind ESL axing the Asian slot in the Impact circuit when HSG female absolutely thrashed FlyQuest Red back then? While I don't advocate for a second Asian slot, at least HSG female deserves more chances in the future, especially when they stole a map from Enigma Galaxy. But this seems, this seems like a perfect question for you to answer. So yeah, you go. I will. Uh, what's the logic behind ESL axing the Asian slot? I have no fucking idea. If you ever find it, just let me know as well. I made a tweet about this. I think it's absolutely unfair. I think the only thing that logically makes sense. So what you've done, I, I don't think you guys really follow the impact scene, but what they've done is they've added an extra slot for EU, mm. right? Which is fair, which is fair, right? You use a stronger region that the top teams are from there. But then for... Uh, so there are two seasons this year, right? This is the first season, the first half of the year, the second season, second half of the year, season five and six, if I'm not mistaken. But season five, they've axed the Asian slot and for season, uh, and, and they've added that to South America. And for season six, they've axed a South American slot and given it back to Asia. It's like they're playing a game of like, you know, hold the ball mm-hmm. for each season, which makes no sense. So basically they're screwing over... And again, I get it, the Asian region isn't the best and whatnot, but the, the fact that they didn't completely destroy, dismantle this team, you know, from North America, which is like a threat, which is which is the best team. And they have Olga, one of the best players from Brazil, uh, who is playing in HSG as well. So the fact that it, it, Asia as a region is getting completely fucked and South America as well, just because, you know, they want to give more importance or maybe some I don't know, like a partnership with the EU orgs or whatnot, because a lot of EU orgs supporting uh, you know, female Counter Strike over there. So I think that's the idea they're going with over here. I'm not a fan. Uh, I'm not sure about the logic. They haven't been open about it either. I have complained about it. I think everyone has uh, been, you know, made it heard that this isn't fair at all. But I, I don't have an answer for you, sadly. You do. Unfortunate. Um, last question. Yeah. He says, ICCS2 taking up Steam in Japan. There was an invitational tournament in Japan with teams normally playing other games. Uh, I think that was, was it called Rage Invitational? It might have been a Rage Invitational. I can't remember. But it was pretty big. It was like last year sometime. Uh, Untitled is now signed by Jedi, which is the very first Japanese esports org which opens up a CS2 team. Ravens also nice. showed promise when they faltered uh, at the last stage of the ESEA Open playoffs. The best result ever achieved by a Japanese team in years. Will this momentum continue or just a temporary thing? I mean, that's a hard question to answer because yeah. I think a lot of that really depends on what are the opportunities that are available. Uh, and by the way, actually, you know, this does remind me, we probably should have um, talked about this. E-Flare, there seems like some shit going on with E-Flare. So I don't know if they're going to be back, um, which would be bad, obviously, for the Southeast Asia region. So I don't know if that necessarily affects Jadeite, whether or not they would play in that kind of a tournament. But the, the point is, and the reason I bring that up is they would need those kinds of tournaments. They would need your Extremes Lands. They would need your E-Flares. They would need your smaller more domestic tournaments, if they're not qualifying, especially if they're not qualifying for things like ESL Challenger League Asia, uh, they would need those direct like Japan Japanese invites, um, which I suspect if, if Extreme Sound would, you know, let's say go back to a 16 team format, no doubt there'd probably be a, a Japanese slot, right? Alongside a Korean slot, alongside a Hong Kong slot, like Hong Kong at this point probably deserves a slot, like Vietnam's got a slot already, these kinds of regions. Um, I think it, 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 it's hard to say because, you know, if nothing changes, if it all stays the same, if the if the circuit doesn't change, no, the momentum won't stay. You know, they'll be around for six months. Their contracts will run out. Japan will move on from CS again. But I think if there was more TOs that pop up, as it seems like there is maybe happening in 2024, and they have 
qualifies for Japan or invites for Japan, I could see something happening. Though I don't think that it's ever going to be like one of the top regions, uh, at least not in the next, let's say, 36 months. It's going to take more than three years for Japan CS to get back to a to a decent level uh, in terms of competitiveness, would be my my guess. Yeah, right. I mean, not much to add to that, honestly. Um, it, it, like The thing with South Korea and Japan, as we've spoken about so many times, there's such a, a very... They're both people you know, That's all you have to say. And it's not just that. No, it's not about just that. But why is it the case, right? They're a very closed off market, so to speak, when it comes to esports in particular, right? Like they have their own thing happening over there. And the reason certain games have popped off, like Valorant, for example, in Japan, uh, in the South Korea as well, or like League, for that matter, in South Korea, whatnot, is like, and Overwatch, right? Uh, again, I'm trying to bring up different games from different uh, publishers. Is the publishers have they made the specific effort to market and push their respective games in these markets. And I think that is something you kind of really have to do in these two countries in particular. Valve don't do that. Hmm. They've never done that. And, and if I try to hold out hope of them doing it, I think I'd be deluded. I think I'm just lying to myself. So unless the team, they just are self-motivated, they hopefully get a sponsor and they're able to somehow pull off something miraculous and maybe inspire other teams and players in the region i won't lie i just don't see a top japanese team coming out anytime in the near future maybe south korea because there is some legacy of counter-strike in south korea right but apart from that i doubt it sadly mm. i would love to go to tokyo man for a fucking cs event like Fuck, you're fuck's dreaming. sake pal you're dreaming aren't you? fuck yeah <laughs> all right well, I think that wraps things up. Uh, obviously, you know, stick around if you're interested in Asia RMR stuff. We'll, we'll be talking about that in the next episode, probably in a week or two. Um, yeah, obviously that'll be out just before the Asia RMR at some point. And uh, we'll look forward to tuning into the Asia RMR as well, because that's going to be, I think that's going to be a very competitive event, but we'll um, talk about that a little bit more when the time comes for, for the next episode. Otherwise, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, comment, do what you need to. Uh, Buymeacoffee.com slash ElfishGuy if you want to give us money. And uh, that'll wrap us up. So see you next time. Hey guys, just at the end of this video, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Jean, who is my first supporter on buymeacoffee.com. If you'd also like to support me financially or any of my content, make sure to check out the link. It is in the description box below.